Juan. I am the program director and the vice president of the chapter. And I am so pleased that our own Kit Veerkamp is the speaker tonight. She designs native plant gardens, is a landscape designer, and she runs our Facebook page. Uh, uh, what is it called? Home Habitat? Kit, you're muted. Hi, um, homegrown habitat. So homegrown we, habitat. So you can keep up. So you can keep up with um, how to incorporate uh, the natives, uh, native plant species in your garden, and why it should be so important. And today she is going to direct her comments to the littlest things around. Oh, other than COVID. Sorry. Uh, little invertebrates <laughs> that you can see with your naked eyes and how insects are part and parcel the recording. Okay, I'm gonna turn this over to Kit. I don't know about the recording status, but thank you very much, Kit, and for everyone who's here. <clears throat> Hi, and welcome. Um, let me get to my screen, and I'm sorry for inadvertently hitting the, uh, <laughs> this record button. Okay, come on. There we go. So can everybody see my screen? Yes, great. Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, thank you and welcome. Um, I'm actually a retired landscape architect and I don't do design work anymore. <laughs> so I just want to get that straight. I do do some consulting and advising, but I don't do design work anymore. Um, I am involved uh, with the Association of Professional Landscape Designers, but in more of an education capacity as well as being involved with CNPS and being a master gardener uh, in El Dorado County. So with that, we will move on and to the presentation, Garden Allies and Gardening to Support Pollinators and Beneficial Insects. And so for the sources of inspiration for this talk, I'd like to share and encourage you to read at least these three books. Um, many of you may be uh, familiar now with Doug Tellamy. He's uh, very, he's the person who has kind of really brought the peril of both insects and con the connection between insects and native plants to light in the recent last three, four, five years. And has been a huge inspiration to me as well as others. Um, this new book, Garden Allies, has literally just come out in the last six months, and it's a wonderful little uh, reference book to have access to um, if you want to know more about the insects that associate with our native plants. So it is a great resource. There we go. So as an overview of what I'm gonna be talking about, I'm gonna be talking first about the nature of nature because that's where it all starts. It all is connected, like I mentioned, connected to our native plants and the ecosystems. A little bit about the insect apocalypse if you are not familiar with it. Um, the new paradigm in, in gardening and the landscape world that can help us develop homegrown habitats to support wildlife and the native insects um, that we have that rely on our native plant um, gardens and how to, how to, eco, to garden in an eco-friendly manner. Um, because if you don't do that, it sort of <laughs> undoes all the purposes and the reasons for gardening with natives. So many of us use our gardens for a lot of different reasons. Recreation, uh, socialization, uh, growing our own food to some extent, whether you just grow vegetable gardens or have edible gardens, uh, for the enjoyment of nature to the extent that our gardens um, attract nature or extend it into our yards, and for the personal solace, the peace and quiet, or whatever you, you know, your personal preferences for, for being out in the garden. I'm trying to get my thing to work with hitting enter, but it's not, okay. So one of the quandaries that many people and gardeners find themselves in 
is how to deal with a lot of the critters they find themselves sharing their gardens with. Um, my gardens, I share with everything, the insects, birds, amphibians, um, including foxes, bobcats, coyotes, mountain lions, and I keep the deer outside with fencing, but the rest of them um, can come into the yard at will just simply because they can all climb fences, um, including the possums and raccoons and rabbits. So, you know, it's one of those things that just comes along with living in a very rural um, environment. Uh, whether you live in the city or suburbs or in more rural areas, you'll have a different mix of what you see as well. This is just an example. These are all photos from my garden of, of the various critters that I come across on a regular basis, different kinds of frogs and toads, um, different butterflies, praying mantises, the little snakes, anywhere from, and garter snakes, uh, various kinds of dragonflies and, and that big old fat lizard there. I don't know if she's pregnant or, I mean, I know they're not pregnant because they lay eggs, but man, she's a fat one. Um, that's one of the things I just absolutely love about being out in my garden is interacting and finding uh, these different critters. But whether we see them as friend or foe, foe um, really depends on our perspective and how we view the, these uh, different organisms. Um, a lot of us are conditioned to see a lot of these as pests or very scary and it's the ooh factor or ew factor. Um, and, but others, again, embrace it and love it. Um, one of the things is that because of this conditioning, we are still using a billion pounds of pesticides in the US annually, both on farms, but in our yards as well. And these pesticides, even though they're getting less toxic to animals, are extremely toxic to invertebrates. And without changing how we deal with what is perceived as a pest, we will continue to, to poison things that we don't intend to. Um, and, and it's still surprising to me that pesticide use in California really still remains at a near record high, both agriculturally speaking and for the home, uh, home gardens. It's interesting to be aware that less than 1% of insect species are actually harmful to plants. And you may look at that and say, yeah, but it's my plants and it's in my yard and I wanna somehow deal with this. Um, you just need to be aware that re um, relative 90% roughly of herbivorous insects, and those are the insects that actually eat or suck or chew on plants, have co-evolved to specialize in this um, relationship that they have with the plants that they do feed on. But native plants have developed defense strategies that actually help minimize the damage that they receive. They react by um, emitting hormones or chemicals to slow down those insects and to make themselves not taste so good. They send messages through their root system and the um, uh, mycorrhizae to alert other plants of the same species as to um, an infestation potentially, so that they can also provide, uh, secrete those, those hormones or chemicals and stave off um, a lot of damage. The non-native plants, however, have, have fewer natural enemies because they have not co-evolved. And this is where a lot of the trouble starts is that people find the pests on their roses or other types of non-native non plants, which we also call uh, introduced plants, and then off we go. We need to convince you and the rest of the world that B is better than A in terms of the op options because the plants are intended to be a food source for our native insects, including cat, especially caterpillars. And as we all know, caterpillars morph into butterflies. So insects typically um, 
like I mentioned, they have intricate relationships with, with plants, many of them. Oftentimes it's a one-on-one. -on -one. It's, a, it's a particular species and a particular insect that have co-evolved and have this. Others are, are more generalist and will feed on a number of different plants. But insects typically fall into four categories. The decomposers, um, those that, that uh, turn organic matter into smaller pieces that then soil organisms break down further and incorporate into the soil and make available to plants. Uh, the predators, or we also call those natural enemies, are pollinators. And those are all under the category of beneficial insects. And then we have our pests, which are typically chewing and sucking insects. But oftentimes, the life cycle of, I'm gonna go back to this, the life cycle of an insect may, may overlap into a number of these categories. For instance, the uh, caterpillar for the monarch butterfly would typically be considered a pest at the point in its life that it's actually chewing and ingesting the milkweed until it lays its chrysalis, in which case it morphs into a butterfly, which is a pollinator. So just need to kind of keep that in the back of your mind that this happens with many insects. These herbivorous insects, the ones that we may call pests, attract and support the natural enemies that help keep them under control. If we don't have some level of, of the herbivores um, or herbivorous insects in the garden, we won't have those uh, natural enemies available and there when they, the pests show up to help control them. And um, for instance, lady beetles, lacewings, and wasps are great examples of um, our natural predators. Birds, amphibians, and reptiles all eat the insects, um, and it doesn't matter what kind they are, and then bats as well. So why should you care about these insects? A lot of people, you look around and I think there's the assumption that there's just so many of them we don't really need to worry about. But obviously we've been seeing the impacts on pollinators in particular. Um, there's been a huge decline. Um, we've been, you know, we're told all the time about the risk to monarch butterflies or other different kinds of pollinators, honeybees, et cetera. And those are not natural native insects, but they are still affected by our gardening practices, especially uses of pesticides. Um, insects in general are essential to, the bio, um, to supporting the terrestrial ecosystems. As mentioned, they cycle um, nutrients that help maintain the soil structure and fertility. They pollinate, they disperse seeds, et cetera. And the big thing is insects are the major food source for most birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish. Without those insects, those populations are challenged and bird populations in particular are in decline, coinciding with the declines in insect populations. Uh, Dr. Art Shapiro from UC Davis, uh, wrote an article and discussed what he called the insect apocalypse, insect apocalypse, because this decline is not happening just here in the United States. It was first noticed in particular in Germany in, in a natural setting. Um, but this has been noticed now and, and um, documented worldwide that our insect species are declining hugely. I mean, 40% decline globally. And in certain parts of the U.S., those declines are even more noticeable. Um, and so in combination with the decline in insects, it's due to both pesticides, or not both, but pesticides, loss of habitat, um, diseases, climate change, and human encroachment in the form of development and habitat loss. In California, we're losing up to 40% of our ex, um, insects per decade. And that, that is tremendous. Um, and these, these losses are affecting insects from butterflies to bees and beetles. 
and resulting in huge declines as well in the bird populations. And this is, you know, they're already challenged enough by everything else in terms of climate change and that. The impact on birds with fewer insects in the environment, the birds are laying fewer eggs. Um, it takes chicks longer to mature and fewer of those are actually surviving to adulthood. Um, and I will have to say that in addition to pesticides, habitat loss is really a huge impact, is, is part of the equation of why these losses are occurring. And we're going to talk about how, how our gardens can help be a part of repairing that and providing more habitat um, for both insects and in turn birds as well. Um, let's see here. Here we go. So the role of insects in the ecosystem is, is really very complex. As I mentioned before, they help decompose dead plants. Um, they sequester a tremendous um, amount of carbon with their bodies, their, their exoskeletons and that. And, and then actually as that's broken down, it gets recycled um, in the soil food web and provides more nutrients to plants. But nearly all insects are harmless and actually beneficial to us. So it, to the extent we can, we need to learn to live with them. Do you remember? Do you remember windshields like this? I do. I used to drive back and forth all the time from Southern California to visit family in the Reno, Yarrington, Tahoe area. I had to stop more frequently to wash my windshield than I did for gas. But I don't even remember the last time I've had a bug splat on my windshield, let alone that extent. So habitat loss is, as I mentioned, is, is creating a lot of this impact in terms of um, decreases in populations. We have in this, uh, in California, more species of birds than anywhere else in the United States, and as well as insects. And many of these species are actually in, in terms of birds and reptiles are endemic to California, which means that they're unique. They're not something we want to lose. Habitat loss is due to a combination of urbanization and all of these other factors, the mega fires that we're having, um, major insect infestations, invasive species out competing native plants, uh, pollution itself impacts these populations and, and habitat. And to think about it, because we are, this, this, our talk is coming from um, the Sierra Nevada, El Dorado County. It, it, it's just kind of disheartening to, to understand that only about 25% of our natural habitat remains intact. This natural state of being all over California is really quite complex. We have one of the richest productive most diverse ecosystems in the in, in northern North America. And all most of these different habitats are literally down to one or five percent remaining in their natural conditions. So our actions are impacting whether or not we're building, we are buying, we're buying homes. Um, we're choosing how we garden, we're choosing how we live our lives. And because of that, this ecological Armageddon can be reversible. We can turn this around, but we have to go beyond the idea that nature exists out there and not where we live. And if we learn to coexist with nature, we can turn this around and individual efforts make a difference. Just can't give up on this. I know that look at as a, as a climate story through the clam, 
um, to the UC A and R. Excuse, excuse. So I live in one of those areas with um, rural rural net, uh, which is our uh, internet provider. And occasionally I will go out, so I will try to stop and back up if I see that. Um, so anyway, our public preserves are not large enough nor connected enough to sustain biodiversity into the future and to make it enough to sustain populations that aren't to, in order for them not to go extinct. Um, we've got our natural, most, most of us are aware of the national park systems, our state and uh, parks and preserves, et cetera. Um, the Endangered Species Act was a big step towards helping maintain integrity in, in the various ecosystems that we do have and, and it's supposed to intervene in terms of with development, but it pretty much doesn't, not anywhere to the extent that we need. So we really need to abandon the whole notion that nature somewhere else and embrace it where we live. This old model um, of people and biodiversity can't exist if we think that it's nature's over there and not part of where we live. And we all have a responsibility for stewardship and that can make a difference. So even though little habitat remains disturbed and very fragmented in terms of what is out there, we can tie it together use, with our gardens. Um, the whole thing of habitat loss is that this occurrence, the fragmentation that occurs with development and roads and all the other aspects of, of human civilization just is breaking up habitat into areas where populations of wildlife, whether it's insects or animals, get so broken up that the populations can't respond. They're not um, resilient enough to survive. And by tying things more back together, animals can be more resilient and have the opportunity for their populations to either at least maintain themselves or even um, resurge. That's the hope. So, in this new conservation model, it's, it's our hope that by providing viable habitat um, and creating, being part of the corridor and the patches that we can stop this decline of, of um, species from our local e ecosystems, reversing the loss of species and providing um, a stronger, more stable ecosystem. Um, oftentimes, I, I know I see people all the time because I belong to a number of, of pollinator friendly sites on, on Facebook is one of the things. And to hear people talk about their experiences with changing, getting rid of their lawns and changing the way they, gar they garden, seeing wildlife come back into their own personal yards is really to me very re rewarding to hear. Um, but this requires the more people who participate in this movement, the more we will see this, this whole situation improve. So we've got, we've got our larger systems, our national parks, our preserves, et cetera, areas in conservation. And then connecting those, we have the crossings and that connection that allows animals to move back and forth when possible. And our gardens can provide that stepping stone, the patches that, that provide places in between and expand habitat. Besides farms and ranches and all these things, all these um, particular private properties, whether it's farms and ranches, small city lots, large corporate, and um, institutional uh, landscapes, municipal parks are all, we need to be looking at it all, but our gardens is where we have the power um, to provide change and, and habitat. And I'm really lost with not being able to just hit my enter button and <laughs> change my slides. So, Knowing that 
parks and preserves are too small um, to do, do the job by themselves. We can't ignore the value of every place else that we have the potential to influence or make changes to. Um, and again, this goes back to what where we have that power is our homes, our gardens to expand habitat. So in participating at home, we provide those patches, we provide connectivity. This is my, a, a picture of my yard, which you'll see I've shown some pictures of the, of the changes in it. And for the most part, what you're looking at, this is all a native garden around, around my pond area. And this is all edible garden here with more native uh, landscaping in the background. And this is only a very small piece of the five acres that I live on. The beauty of doing this in your own yard is it allows that opportunity to interact on a personal level with nature and to partake in it and enjoy it 365 days a year. This is how we started out after getting started on my landscape and creating, um, you know, I live in the foothills, so it's, it's not, I don't live in a flat environment and terracing was the way that was going to work for me to, to change this. And for the most part, the area that is terraced is my edible gardens. And the area up front is, is I think the first year of most of my Navy, yes, it is the first year because I can see uh, the coffee berry, the uh, California anemones, Artemisia, um, salvias, spice bush, um, just get different coyote mints, all the rest. So these are just some of the plants. This is just one small area um, where I started planting natives and there's natives in this area as well. This is just last spring, not this spring. Um, and, and you can see how much things are already growing in. My, my fruit trees are all planted. I do have strawberries under them there. These terraces up here, I have planted wild, native wildflowers under to uh, boost that habitat. Uh, yep. So finding space oftentimes, yes, everybody doesn't probably have five acres, nor do you want it. <laughs> I still kind of go, oh, I could have done just fine with a whole lot less, but ha having the space to do this is oftentimes a lot of people's challenge. But one of the things that almost every yard seems to have in California, almost all, if you haven't already uh, removed it, is they have lawns. And those are a great place to start with restoring habitat. Turf grass is a monolithic crop that does not support much wildlife. It's really an ecological desert. So it's a place that to me is a guilt-free place to look at for st a starting place. I mean, lawns are costly, no matter what. They take a lot of time, money, and effort um, in terms of supporting them. The comparison to native plants in terms of what they do or don't do, native plants filtrate and cleanse water and that goes back into the soil, but plus moves on through, through the ecosystem. It sequesters um, far more carbon than lawn does. Um, lawns transpire less um, moisture, or plants transpire less moisture into the air as part of the water cycle. Our irrigation schedules are all based on well-watered lawns. And it's like, this is, this is something that is going to have to be re-looked at, re-examined in the landscape world in terms of even attaining higher, um, greater water savings. Because again, everything is based on this whole, whole logic of needing to well water lawns and then backing off of that. But native plant gardens can take far less than even um, sometimes what the different schedules, there's, there's um, different plant um, databases that tell you roughly what they think uh, native plants take. And there's not much research really on that yet. This is still a work in progress. 
Uh, lawns don't provide food or shelter for wildlife, and they are a carbon sink, not a carbon source, as much as the lawn industry, the turf industry would like to try to convince you otherwise. Just because a plant is green is, does not make it good enough. The plants, and especially our native plants, determine the carrying capacity for wildlife because of the whole coevolution aspect of them. But introduced plants don't support our native animals through their life cycle like natives do. And when they replace natives, they actually decrease and decimate the local species diversity. When you look at some of the subdivisions, we're watching this happen down in the Folsom area, just wide swaths, hundreds of acres at a time turned into subdivisions. And they are not planting natives as, as their primary palette. They're just replacing, replacing the natives with introduced species. And so now you're taking out hundreds of acres of, of native plants and everything that's related to them. Um, so our introduced plants just do not perform the ecological roles that natives do. The amount of water usage with lawns is absolutely off the charts. Um, here we are going back into another severe drought year. Uh, I don't even know if we, and, I mean, there is talk that this may be the start of another mega drought. The water that, that we've seen, um, the climate over the last 200 years, 250 years or longer, slightly longer, has their finding through the, eco or the uh, geologic record that that has been an anomaly. It has been unusually wet. California has been far drier in the past and this is, um, that dryness is something that our native plants our nat and our ecosystems are all adapted, adapted to. Turf, so 70% of our household water in urban areas is dedicated to um, landscape. And of that water in the landscape, typically 70% goes to turf, to turf use. And this is one of the reasons that there are new laws now um, regulating how much high water use plants or an area can be dedicated to high water use in any uh, new development because it is not sustainable. And then again, you and coming along with lawns, the typical lawn, the suburban lawn, people use 10 times more chemical pesticides than are used in farmland. And this is really what impacts a lot of our, besides habitat, habitat loss, these pesticides and insecticides are killing off far more populations of insects, affecting all the other wildlife downstream from it in terms of the food chain than what is intended. Um, the fertilizers that we apply to lawns wind up in the water table or downstream affecting water quality in our creeks. And there's also a link between pesticide use and cancer in pets and children. Because when you think about the, your use of these chemicals, if you have a lawn and you're using them, our pets are out there on, on a regular basis, very close noses in it. And then children also are very, very much uh, more susceptible um, in their young ages to these chemicals that are being used. And you just need to be aware of that. Um, I know I had somebody ask me one time, well, what do I do about the, the, the black widows in my, in my yard? And it hadn't even occurred to me at that point to say, <laughs> is a spider bite a more of a concern to you than the potential for the effect on your children's health? It, that's one way to think about it. So the solution is rather simple and with regard to lawns. Don't make a lawn any larger um, than you need if you need it at all. Really question that or what type of lawn you need. You may just want just enough for um, 
you know, kids or dogs to play on with a plan in mind um, to have that evolve into something else. And excuse me one minute. For some reason, something downstairs became unmuted. Um, selecting native species will help reduce the amount of water required in your land, your landscape. Um, the other thing you can do is to mow higher and less frequently, and particularly with a mulching mower. There was a study I just heard um, when I attended a seminar just uh, last week, where they did a whole study on the numbers of pop uh, pollinators and how it changed whether you mowed your lawn once a week, twice a week, or two, every two weeks or every three weeks. And they, they did this study for two years on a number of different homes. And they really did find that there was far more pollinators, active pollinators in lawns that were not mowed, uh, that were mowed every three weeks as opposed to the weekly. And then also reducing um, and not using fertilizers, um, pesticides or herbicides, insecticides in particular in your lawns. If you're going to have a lawn, maintain it naturally. I did this with um, another home, my first home I owned, and I used a mulching mower. I fertilized the first time I planted the lawn and not for the next 18 years that I did it. And it was a perfectly healthy lawn. I also irrigated it all twice a week as opposed to every day, which a lot of people tend to do. There's a lot of variation in what a lawn can look like. This one in the upper right hand corner is, is typically what we'll see. I'd almost say that looks like one of those fake turf lawns, but letting it go and be more natural, to me, I find this far more pleasing and mowing a path through it and letting grasses grow to their natural in their natural state, especially the bunch grasses, I find that very pleasing myself. And the amount of biodiversity this bottom photo shows or supports or even the upper left is amazingly different um, than the one on top. So we've already talked about insect herbivores are many of them are diet specialists in particular 90% of them are down to the almost the one on one um, special specializing in terms of host plant and 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 the insect that feeds on them. Um, and there's benefit to both the the plant and the organism feeding on them in that uh, that makes them you think in particular of monarch butterflies. Um, and these specializations took a very, very long time um, to occur. Uh, the evolutionary process is not something that happens overnight or even in thousands of years. It's in the terms of millions of years. Monarch butterflies we know, we all know are dependent on milkweed. And that again, didn't happen overnight. One of the unfortunate aspects of all the introduced plants that we see in the suburbs and around the homes, the majority of homes in this state are really a homogeneous palette of introduced ornamental plants um, that don't support the insect populations or the birds and all the other organisms that depend on the insects related to native plants. So how this wild wildlife food web works is that plants are the basis. They transform that, that sun energy into carbohydrates through um, photosynthesis. And then those carbohydrates are either stored in the plant or um, and in the roots or fed on by animals. Um, in particular, you know, I mean, a lot of animals do, again, the sucking and chewing insects are looking for those carbohydrates, which are then converted into plant sugars um, and proteins that other animals need to survive. Um, whoops, excuse me. And so through these relationships, this whole transfer of the energy gets moved through the food chain. Through the reduction of native plants has resulted in the consequences of this huge reduction in, in caterpillar biomass 
which in turn affects the populations of birds. And that's because the majority of birds, almost all birds, even though they may be seed eating in the future as adults, rely on caterpillars um, in their, you know, when once they crack out of the shell, that's what their parents are feeding them. And it's because of the protein and the fat that is available in, in caterpillars. Um, and this reduction that we're experiencing in our native pollinators is very affected by this by the impact and loss of native habitat and native plants. So the, again, the introduced plants can't compete with natives in terms of supporting native, native insects and therefore the insectivores and all the other organisms that rely on them. They aren't good at supporting the specialist pollinators. Um, they don't fit into the complex food web or a stable food web even. They don't support the biodiversity. They support much fewer insects in terms of, and particularly pests, non-native pests. I mean, when we talk about those that, that are coming in from other countries and then devastating our, our agricultural industry. Um, and then that actually reverberates right on into our own gardens if we have fruit trees or other types of plants that are affected by those, those pests. So I just really wanna stress that introduced plants are not the ecological equivalent of the native plants that they are replacing. I know a lot of people say, oh, but our plants, our plants are doing just fine. Um, you, know, they're, they're a, you know, they're fitting in and they're growing well. And, and so why do we need to change them out? But the whole thing is they may be adapting and they may do fine here, but chances are they do require more water but what they don't do is support the animal life. Um, our native plants have co-evolved not only with the insects that, that feed on them or rely on them for their life cycles, but they have also co-evolved with the fungi and the microorganisms in the soil to form this very complex uh, network and that supports the biological diversity that we see and enjoy. And it's our natives that do the very best job for providing the food and shelter for our native animals. So when we come across pests, oftentimes people just automatically run to the store and, and look for the first pesticide, insecticide that they can find to deal with a particular pest. But the problem is that these poisons have unintended consequences. They affect the human health and pet health, as I mentioned before. But the problem, the big problem is that they are, they're indiscriminatory in terms of killing many other insects, um, including beneficial insects that normally help, help keep them under control. And they, with continued use of these insecticides, they become resistant and so the breakouts get worse with time. Not only that, but these um, pesticides, insecticides are detrimental to all the wildlife that rely on those insects as a food source. In his, one of his books, Doug Tallamy likens the ecosystems to a well-oiled machine that operates best with all of their parts, which perform different functions. But what they don't, work well with is the unintended monkey wrench, adding something to the system that doesn't work and it doesn't belong. Um, so that's when the way I think of introduced plants because they really don't belong here. Um, I'm not absolutely a purist, but in terms of how I view my overall garden, I really am trying besides my fruit trees and the, the plants I use for as a food source, I'm really trying hard to not impact negatively the ecosystem that I'm trying to develop to support wildlife. So we have a lot of beneficial insects and many of you are gonna look at this screen and go, ah, <laughs> you know, this is, no, no, no. Yeah, you'll be reaching for your can of raid. Hopefully not because all of these insects here are beneficial. Um, 
and help control other insects like aphids and those types of things that are particularly um, a problem, problematic. Oftentimes, whether we perceive them as a problem, really, you know, I'm, I see the, the yellow uh, oleander aphids on my milkweed that just seem to come with them. And I've really kind of just ignored them. And what I've noticed is that for the most part of the year anymore, they're not even there. They don't, they show up once the plants start to become a little more drought stressed, but they've disappeared for the most part. Um, our natural enemies are a wonderful form of low input, a low input strategy for controlling um, pests. It's a sustainable solution that is there all the time and keep the pests in check. They're, and they're actually part of the ecosystem. This is their jobs and they enhance biodiversity. So we're gonna look at a few of these natural enemies just to kind of familiarize yourself with them and the diversity there. Our aphid midges, damsel bugs, and grease, uh, green lace wings. You can see the different um, stages in their lives. And the unique thing is that they're not affected just as adults or not just in their larval stages. Oftentimes they're very effective. They may be most effective at one particular stage, but they're effective also in their other stages. Um, lady beetles are one, let's see, did I go? Yeah. So we've got our grain, uh, ground beetles, our lady beetles, and the minute pirate bugs. Well, Kit, we've lost you. If you can go back a little bit when you get back on. Or type Marvel stage. The am I back on yet? Yes, now you are. We've missed about a minute. Okay, so is this one? Oh, and there goes my there goes my connection again. You were just talking about the pirate um, bugs. Oh, okay. So the lady beetles, the larval stage of the lady beetles are even more effective at eating um, and controlling aphids than the adult lady, lady bugs are. So one of the things that, that I've done on our property is note, I've noticed the amount of the larval stage uh, of lady beetles out in the grasses in the pasture and so I stopped mowing those, those so frequently, and I tried to put it off until as late as possible to give the lady beetles a chance to mature and then fly off, but plus they stick around and lay more eggs. So if you are on property where you notice that you have naturally have lady beetles, being aware of this and really looking closely, if you have the larval stages, that means that they are laying their eggs nearby and you want to keep that up. You want to support that. Um, ground beetles are great. They really help um, control populations, especially of the types of bugs that are attacked or, or vegetable gardens. They're voracious predators of slugs, snails, cutworms, cabbage, uh, cabbage magnet, maggots, all these insects that you see here. So there's something you want to encourage to, to be around and, and not get freaked out by them and not go after the grubs that you see in the soil early on because those are going to mature into the beetles that are very beneficial. The parasitic wasps are fabulous at controlling, um, helping to control aphids and tomato, other cat caterpillars, but in particular, the tomato hornworms. And these, these wasps can be the size of an ant or smaller. So oftentimes they're not even something you notice are around or you just think just a little tiny flying insect, but they are susceptible to insecticides. Uh, soldier beetles, spiders, tachyon and hoverflies, all beneficial insects that help control other insects. And to support all of those the beneficial insects, you really want to try to maintain a continuous supply of flowers. And here, you know, we've got Queen Anne's lace. Uh, yarrow is particularly great at supporting a, a wide variety of the natural predators. 
the natural predators not only are looking for the other insects to, to feed on, but often at some point in their development, they also need the pollen and nectar of these very small flowers. So keeping a continuous supply of flowers not only supports pollinators, but it supports the beneficial insects as well. So pollinators go much further than just including the bees and the butterflies. That includes wasps, moths, flies, butterflies, and beetles. Um, I know as much as you may not think of it, um, flesh fly, I'm trying to remember which plants. There is a particular, I, I'm thinking it's one of our native vines that is pollinated by, by flesh flies. And then we've got other types of flies that are pollinators. And the butterflies, we all enjoy seeing them, but what you may not be really aware of is in the caterpillar stage. You may see these caterpillars and not be aware of the fact that, you know, their, their eggs are underneath the fallen leaves underneath your um, oak trees. And when you uh, blow those away or shred them or put them in bags and, and put them in the trash, you are getting rid of populations of the caterpillars of these, of the butterflies and moths. Um, beetles are pollinators. And I do see that once I became more aware of them and looking at my flowering native plants, it is just really fun to see this huge array of other things besides bees and butterflies. Now our common bees include this, this list of bees, including the honeybees, but honeybees are not native if you were not aware of it. There are European spe species that are pretty much considered livestock. Um, they're being uh, greatly affected by col colony collapse disorder, which is um, affected by a number of different uh, aspects that are different. Mm, losing the word, but anyway, um, it's not a one, it's not just one thing. It's not just pesticides. It's a combination of, of uh, predatory mites. And I believe that those were um, imported as well. Uh, the pesticides weaken their systems, the poor nutrition of non-native plants, and then the other pathogens effects. And so those all add up and contribute to this, the colony collapse disorder, which shortens the lives of hives. In California alone, we have over 1,600 species of native bees. The majority of these bees nest underground, and they're they are and they they don't travel as far as honeybees typically. Um, the majority of bees don't travel more than a football football field's length in terms of foraging from their nesting areas. And so they either, most bees nest underground 70% and then the rest nest tend to nest in cavities. And whether that's plant stems or under the shingles of your house or little nooks and crannies, um, that's where you'll oftentimes, you'll see bees flying in and out of little spaces. Our bumblebees are very social and, and um, hopefully you're not freaked out by them. I think that's really fun to kind of watch them clamber around the flowers and, and, um, and if they don't feed directly in terms of with their proboscis in the flowers, they'll actually drill into the base of a flower to get that um, nectar out. Our bumblebees are needed for the pollination of tomatoes, eggplants, and blueberries if you grow those in your yard um, because it, they, those plants require buzz pollination. So if you want your eggplant and tomatoes and blueberries to be uh, setting better fruit, plant natives nearby that will attract the bumblebees and they will then be there to help cross-pollinate those plants. Our carpenter bees, wonderful to watch too. Um, and if you have a lot of wood, it, it's a good thing to keep fallen logs in that on your property if, if you have the ability to do that. Um, I know bum, uh, carpenter bees can be problematic, but for the most part, they're beneficial insects. Our leaf cutter bees, I always find these fascinating. It's always fun to see the uh, red buds where they just cut out all these little circles out of the edges of our plants. 
and they roll those up and stick them in a stem or um, and lay their egg and then they'll lay another one and another one until they have the whole stem uh, occupied with their eggs. So they're not harmful to the plants. You may see it and some people consider it imperfection. I consider it a win in terms of seeing them, um, the, the noticing that the activity is there. The longhorned bees, really quite, you know, uh, you may see those on your plants, especially on the asters. The orchard mason bees, I, um, I know that they talk about the whole um, aspect of col colony collapse disorder and um, oftentimes orchardists are not able to find enough, you know, uh, hives to pollinate their orchards. If you can promote the orchard mason bees to nest nearby, they are actually even better workers, more effective pollinators than the honeybees are, as you can see here. Our sweat bees, these are oftentimes the blue or green metallic sweat bees um, you'll notice around, and they're a generalist pollinator. The hummingbirds, just through their very uh, act of uh, collecting nectar, pollinate the flowers that they uh, collect nectar from. So as with most native animals, pollinators need food, shelter, and water as, as well, if you want to promote and, and really encourage them to be in your yard. They're also affected by your plant selection and the diversity of plants you offer and the arrangement of the plants. So we know that our native bees have co-evolved um, to utilize our native plants. So the fewer native plants we have in our yard, chances are there'll be far fewer native pollinators. Um, so including more, more native plants will, it will, I can tell you that from my own experience, increase the amount of native pollinators you have. Um, studies through UC, um, UC, the UC system, matter of fact, I think these actually anymore, everybody's studying pollinators. These studies are supported. Um, you'll find tons of them wherever if you, if you search for them. But 80% of our native bees were attracted to uh, native plants over non-native plants. And I think you can see here that the numbers that support that. So pollinators are looking for nectar and pollen. They're looking for large masses of flowers and large masses, they, they term as roughly 10 square feet. If you think three feet by three feet, that's nine, that's close enough. One plant oftentimes will, will be that. Um, some of the sages, most, most of our plants, whereas if you have say groupings of uh, yarrow, it'll take a number of yarrow to make a massing that big, but you want to think about not just putting in that, in that case, your coral bells, your, your yarrows, any, any of the smaller plants, you wanna to tend to create groupings so that you have at least roughly a 10 square foot area of that particular plant. It gives you more bang for the buck in terms of attracting the pollinators that are attracted to that. And then also think in terms of uh, providing a, a variety of flower shapes, sizes, and color um, because different insects are attracted to different um, sizes, shapes, and color. And then also think about extending that bloom time. Go back, extending the blue and overlapping your bloom times. Try to get blooms from the earliest uh, blooming plants, which, which are usually the manzanitas um, and, and the bacchus, are blooming generally in, in January, often. And then just keep up with having plants that are blooming continuously into, I know my California fuchsias are still blooming in November. So for the most part, you get the biggest bang for your buck. The thing is that most of these pollinators are dormant in the winter, so you do not have to worry about having pollination or, and flowers in mid of winter because those, anim, those bees or those insects have already either died or gone dormant 
and our um, overwintering in burrows. Uh, let's see, we talked about that. So the, this is what oftentimes people think that they're looking at an ant mound. Um, if you see holes like this in the ground, but there's never any ants around them. It's just kind of a little mound of dirt and that is most likely a, a native pollinator, a ground nesting pollinator that's using, utilizing that. So just being aware and providing some bare ground for them to nest will have them um, have populations, keep populations up in your yard of these, of these wonderful pollinators. So native berries are another food that very much our, popu our, our populations depend on and wildlife. And through, you know, through the pollination, obviously the berries um, are the next step in terms of the fruits that are produced, but they support birds. And it's one of the things that in particular, I know one of the things I've done in my own yard because I've got all the fruit, I have planted a number of species of ribes and the Prunus um, elicifolia, which is the, I think it's the cherry laurel, may not have that common name right, but planting other berries to offset and distract hopefully the birds away from my fruit, but providing them a natural source of the foods that they would normally eat. So in building your own homegrown habitat, again, back to shrink your lawn or, or get rid of it all together. Um, it, it's an area to give you more to do something with native plants. Remove any invasive species that's high on the priority list as opposed to um, other plants that you may wanna leave in until such time it's time to take them out um, because invasive species are just much harder to control and they easily displace our natives. Planting keystone species. Um, keystone species are in essence the plants that, that are the powerhouses for, the land, um, for our landscapes, native landscapes. Oak trees, for instance. 14% um, keystone species. 14% of keystone species actually provide 90% of an insect's food in our state. And they out really help keep the food well, web healthier and the biodiversity is greatly increased with keystone species. So you get, it's one of those that you just get a whole lot more bang for the buck. Um, you know, planting for specialist pollinators. One of the unique things that you can do, and I'll show you, uh, be showing you in just a little bit how to use the cowscape site. If you know you have particular pollinators um, that are special to your area, you can look to see what plants support those and plant those in order to encourage them in your yard. I inadvertently discovered that I have bumblebee moths that are attracted to my coyote net, to the monardella. And I had never seen them until that time. And now I've made sure to plant more more of it um, in terms of um, supporting those because I just, I have never seen them anywhere else. Um, hopefully they will continue to be here. If you have neighbors who are like-minded, encourage them that you can work together to kind of plan a bigger and more, uh, a bigger, mm, for a bigger impact and to create more biodiversity by connecting up, um, more space that's planted in natives. So besides just the plants, you also providing water features of some type will help encourage wildlife of all kinds, but, but um, the insects as well, whether it's a bird bath or a larger water feature. And this is my water, waterfall in my pond. And I just, I can't tell you how much enjoyment I get from watching the birds visit all the time. Uh, they're greatly attracted to that. Bee hotels are one way to support our native bee populations um, for the 30% of the population that don't nest in the ground. However, it's more effective and better for their health and the populations to put small, uh, like what I'm showing here, the small nesting uh, cans or opportunities 
place them around your yard as opposed to on the very right hand side here. This is not the best approach to take simply because it's, it becomes more of a vector for disease or other predators that, that uh, would prey on these particular bees when you've got them all compacted together. I mentioned to you that oftentimes um, caterpillars pupate under, under the leaves of, uh, on the ground. They don't all crawl up a plant and then uh, create a chrysalis. And we really need to promote the caterpillars to support bird populations. Um, so a lot of times these eggs are laid and then they drop to the ground with the leaves for the purpose. I mean, it's just kind of the way it all works together. And then those, they emerge out of that if those leaves are left undisturbed. And in my yard, because I have so many leaves, I end up just, just gently raking the leaves off under, under the oak trees because the oak trees need, need that. That's how in nature, oak trees get their nutrition is from the leaves uh, decomposing and being um, reabsorbed or, or reworked back into the soil profile. Um, and again, lawns are gonna get mowed. So any leaves that are falling on the lawn are probably going to get chewed up and there goes that population. So talking of getting back to keystone species, all of these are all the native oaks we have in our part of California, in the California foothills. Um, we may have a few others, but these in particular, I know I've got all five of these um, on my property and um, wonderful trees and quite large. Um, wild cherries, the bitter cherry, the prun prunus uh, emarginata and virginiana, the choke cherries, these provide great opportunity for the pollinators and then later for the birds when the berries emerge and ripen. The willows, if you have places that where the, you're, you know, you've got a wet spot, um, if you are on an irrigation canal or you've got a creek coming through your property, taking the opportunity to get willows established really helps with the insect populations and enhances biodiversity. Uh, lupin, sagewort, coyote bush, senecio, these are all plants that greatly help um, with biodiversity. Now you wanna be careful with some of these plants. We also live in a very high fire danger area so things like the sage wart and the coyote bush, you wanna make sure you keep beyond the 30 foot distance from your, from your structures because they are much more flammable because they just have a lot more resins and turpins and the types of chemicals and volatiles in their leaves that make them more flammable. But it doesn't mean you have to eliminate them. It just means you need to be more thoughtful um, and planning where you put those. Uh, goldenrod, rabbit bush, deer vetch, the wild strawberries. Um, I've been very pleased to see on one of my slopes where I planted wild strawberry two years ago, I was starting to think, oh gosh, maybe I made a, didn't make a good selection. And then this winter, winter, winter number two or three, all of a sudden I'm having, it's all filling in and it's looking wonderful. And the nice thing about this is this particular ground cover stays very low ground hugging. So if you to keep it controlled or you're worried about snakes, the wild strawberries are a nice way to go. And the birds do love the berries as well. So I'm gonna now walk you through some of our resources or encourage you to look for resources if you're not in our area of El Dorado County, there are chapters of CNPS all over the state who have their own fabulous resources. Um, our chapter offers a number of resources for gardening um, that you can read up on and use to find out more about exactly how to plant, what the, what the considerations are um, for soil prep, for instance. You really don't want to, and you don't need to be um, preparing soil. Our native plants, for the most part, are adapted to Soils low in organic matter and nitrogen. That's one of the reasons they are slow growing, but when they get too much of a good thing, they actually 
don't necessarily thrive for a long time. They might for a while, but they may be shorter lived with too much of a good thing, so to speak, the way we traditionally think of it. This is one of the plant lists that I believe Dara and some of our other board members were instrumental in putting together in terms of recommendations of plants for the garden in El Dorado County on West Slope in particular. But many of these I think um, are suitable for the Tahoe area as well. Um, and this probably goes pretty much for the Sierra foothills when, when you think about that. We have very similar climate up and down the Sierra foothills. So this is usable a lot of other places. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit on how to use Calscape. This is just an absolutely fabulous resource that if you, once you learn to use it, it, it's an amazing tool. It is currently being revamped right now, but you can still use it as it is, as I'm showing you, but there are some major improvements coming from CNPS to make this even a much more powerful garden, gardener's resource. So when you get to the calscape.org site, this is what you will see. You can type in the specific area or even your address to, to pull up plants that are native to your specific locale. Um, and then go to advanced search, which is up here in the right-hand corner. You don't have to look for specific species yet. That advanced search will take you to a whole list of parameters that you can check off to find because you may have one area that is very shady in your yard and you need specific plants for that to suit that area. And then you may have a west facing hot summer area um, that gets full sun late in the day or nearly all day. So you need to look for plants that are suitable for that area. Um, whether you want, you can see all the different types of plants. So you may be looking for something specific. You can narrow it down to that. Uh, the water requirements. You know, if you just really, really want to get into landscaping with no water after you get your plants established, you can aim to do that. Or if you're looking that you have an existing garden with introduced plants, but you want to transition over to natives, you may be looking at the low or moderate high categories to, to find plants that will work with the current irrigation system that you have so that you're not killing off either the plant you already have or killing off these new uh, natives that you may be planting. And then there's all of these other parameters that um, also you can pick by local nurseries. I mean, that would be a challenge when you start narrowing things down like that, but flower color, et cetera. Um, let's see. So in this case, I did search based on these parameters for the town. I live in the town of Cool. Yes, there's such a place if you're not uh, from up around here. People think sometimes think that's a joke. <laughs> in that case, because I chose full sun, uh, extremely low water, very easy, and for bee gardens, it came up with two plants. Now that's not always, this is not, you know, it just shows you what the limitations can be, especially when you're looking for extremely low options. I know for, for a fact that some of the sages and the Fermontodendron, which is also known as flannel bush, also do very well here. This is just one example. Then I went back and did another selection, looking for part shade and moderate to high water so that I could look at plants that I could grow underneath my um, fruit trees that would be compatible. And came up with a whole uh, much varied list, much wider selection of plants to choose from. Um, and you will get the, so once you get this list of plants, then you can collect, uh, connect, click on any particular one to get a whole lot more information. In this um, particular case, the creek dogwood, it'll show you where the species is found naturally. It'll also, it'll tell you a whole lot more, perhaps more than you ever wanted to know about the plant itself, the type of plant it is, how large it gets, um, its dormancy, if it is dormant at all, um, the color of the flowers, and it'll also show you what type of um, wildlife is supported by the plant. 
The other information is, is the type, if it has any kind of special soil requirements. Most, But one of the really kind of neat, unique um, things this will show you is other companion plants that go well with that particular species that are found in nature growing in a similar, sharing the, the same habitat. So it can give you other ideas about, oh gosh, well, I want this plant, but I need something more than just that. Well, you can look at these companion plants for suggested ideas. Most of the plants do show the sunset zone um, so that you can get a better idea of whether it will do well in your specific area. They're not all listed for every plant, but for the most part, if you just simply look at the map, you'll get an idea of whether or not it will grow where you are. Um, in terms of the habitat enhancement, leaving some things, um, if you have the ability to leave wood decaying um, in place on your property, there's all kinds of insects that will utilize that to um, reproduce and do their jobs. Let's see. So once you've got your, your, your new homegrown habitat, your maintenance and your management um, practices really will influence how well everything does. Um, again, gonna focus, really try to focus on having a continuous supply of flowers so that your, your pollinators and your um, beneficial insects are supported all year long. Remember to provide bare patches of soil for um, the ground nesting um, bees and pollinators. Do not use pesticides and herbicides. You know, the, the, there's a time and a place, but not in your native garden. I would really discourage it. Um, and do not till the soil. That is so disruptive to the soil life. Um, yes, you need to dig a hole to plant your, your, new, your new natives and digging it wider no deeper than the plant is in terms of its root ball. Don't dig it any deeper because what you don't want happening is for that plant to sink down and water to sit around the crown of the plant um, once you walk away. And leave the leaves in terms of the maintenance, ongoing maintenance, if you can. Least leave some. Here, here's one of the reasons. You can see in this particular image, here's eggs of, of various insects underneath, hidden in these leaves. So, you know, if you remove them, you're removing populations of insects and that birds are, are probably going to be feeding on. All of these insects live in that little microbiome that you have there and rely on those leaves being there to also be there. I know I have wonderful populations of um, the little tree frogs around in, in my yard that are supported and the ring neck snakes, I've seen those, bumblebees. I know I've got luna moths as well. So just again, thinking in terms of how that enriches the habitat in your yard, hopefully may get you to rethink removing the leaves if you currently do. Again, don't, don't spray herbicides, insecticides, uh, pesticides, etc., cetera. And um, fertilizers are something that native plants do not need your help with. Um, artificially fertilized soils really do encourage animals eating your plants and especially deer. It makes plants push more tender, um, new leaves that are particularly delectable to deer and, and, to, and to mice and some other, other types of, um, of animals that may be in your yard. So again, using a little compost doesn't hurt occasionally to help improve some soils, but the native plants don't require the kind of support that introduced plants need. Um, and especially synthetic fertilizers end up just affecting water quality downstream. Um, your vegetable garden may need them and, and that's okay to use them there. I would encourage you to use organic fertilizers because they're not, there's not as much of that 
that's going to make its way into the water table that way. Most of it will get used up in, you know, in, in, your, in your beds. So using local, the local natives, our local natives, as I mentioned before, are adapted to our soils. Um, they are used to soils that are not rich in organic matter. Um, some of them, if they do need that, that's where they grow, where they already get that, where leaves tend to collect and, and just sit and decay. And you'll, you'll see that the plant life that grows in those locations is very different than the plants that grow out where there's not as, as much leaf litter and other plant material decaying. Um, the use of security lights at night, if you have those because they attract um, thousands of moths that then don't make it due to the fact that they're just attracted to these lights, if you have them and you feel you need them, put on mo motion sensors on them to help uh, see that they don't come on all the time or just stay on. If you're mowing, no matter whether you're mowing on or you're mowing pastures for fire hazards, try to set your mower up high enough to not um, affect the wildlife. I, I know I've accidentally mowed over a five foot garter or gopher snake out in my pasture two years ago. And so now <laughs> I weed eat instead of go out with the mower because I just couldn't stand it. Um, To the effect that you have the ability to affect, if you live in an HOA and can affect the, their um, policies and um, their attitudes towards native plants anymore, the laws in California do not allow HOAs to restrict you from using native plants um, and to create your own habitats in your yards. So just be aware of that. If you live in an area like that and you're getting harassed, um, you just need to simply look up the laws and educate your HOAs as to that. Um, a lot of people, there's a big movement afoot uh, all through in many cities and uh, towns throughout California. People are pushing to get their city councils and school districts in that to get school gardens, native school gardens in their schools or to change and get their uh, municipalities to incorporate more natives in their landscapes. So are you gonna be a baler or a dumper? Are you going to contribute to the problem or are you gonna help with this in terms of, of doing something a new way and actually supporting our wildlife? It's your choice and what, and those choices affect what's going to be out there in your yard. So besides, um, we don't really have a helpline in terms of through, through uh, CNPS. Uh, you might be happy to know that roughly half of our board now are master gardeners. And so through that program, um, you may be able to ask us on the Homegrown Habitat page if you're not familiar with that. Um, we have a Homegrown Habitat page for El Dorado County on Facebook. I believe um, we also have an Instagram page. I don't know about Twitter on on that, but you can ask questions of us and we will do our best to respond to those questions. And the, what I like about our Facebook page is then you get the benefit of getting feedback from the other uh, people who are gardening with native plants in our own community. And that can be a real benefit. So anyway, I wanna thank you for being here. And I'm gonna take us back. And, and thank I you, Kate. We, yeah, we answer do questions. Have some yeah, we do have some nice questions in the chat. Maybe we'll just quickly do those first. And then if people have um, ones that they want to raise their hand for too. We have one here, Kit, from Mary Lee, where she says, how do we combat the big insurance companies that require 100 foot safety zone? Tree canopies must be 18 feet apart. I'd have to remove half of my trees and road committees that insist on using poisoning to kill roadside weeds. What would be equally effective on road edges? So those are sort of two questions there. Okay. So both Alice and I also teach the fire, um, fire resilient, defensible space classes in this county. We are two, two, two of three people <laughs> who do it and with an emphasis on native plants. 
Um, we do have presentations on specifically on that, um, both on our CNPS site and on YouTube. If you um, Google or if you search um, El Dorado County Master Gardeners, you will find one for me that is both um, home hardening and creating defensible space. Go to the second half of the presentation because it's a two hour presentation and particularly look at the lists and the suggestions for how to deal with your landscaping. By creating, use the, using the island and streams effect, the island effect um, with planting your natives, like you saw in my own yard, there's lots of walkways and lots of islands in my yard and that helps break up those areas. But plus my landscape is mostly out 10 feet away from our decks. So there are ways to do it. Um, the new standards call for absolutely no vegetation within five feet of your structures, both the home and your decks, um, and including no organic mulches. You need to be looking at pavers, um, stepping stones, gravel, decomposed granite, um, some other. But these standards don't preclude the use of native plants in your yard. It's the types of native plants, non-woody plants in the first 30 feet. You can use the trees though, but it's the spacing and the separation between those. And I do get, okay, so what you're asking about, I have 200 year old oak trees right near my house, but I don't have ladder fuels under them. My house would have to burn down for those trees to catch fire because I have separated the canopies of those oak trees from all the other oak trees out of my property by a minimum of 20 feet. To, to, if those caught on fire, they're not going to immediately ignite those closest to my home. So you can do it, but you do have to make those choices for your own safety and for the safety of your neighbors for those trees not to become fuel in a wildfire. So I hope that answers your question. Those resources are out there. Do you have anything Maybe to add to that, Alice? Um, what was that? Do you have anything to add to that? Um, oh, well, mostly just that her question also brought up a good point that um, she's having trouble with the insurance company because the insurance company is requiring her to take out these trees. And is there any way to talk to the insurance companies? And that that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. And then the other thing she was talking about was um, poison, you know, the, the weed killer that people are using along roads for the weeds. That's a tough one. As a president of an HOA myself, I have to contract to have the edge of the road sprayed because people will not take, will not come out and maintain their weed, the weed, a weed free area. And it affects the, um, it affects the soundness of our roads. When they start getting infet weed infested, it starts breaking up the pave, the you know chip and seal roadways. We don't have asphalt; we can't afford that. So that is one of those things where you have to choose between the evil. I only have a three foot space. Um, you know, it, the preference is for uh, pre-emergence as opposed to the contact herbicides, but it, it, sometimes. When we live in an area like we live in, I, I don't know. It's some There are some things that it beats spraying the entire property, but with things like that, I, I don't know what else to say. You know, they've got to look out for the soundness of their roads and then the fire danger as well, so. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to weigh in on that. Um, Yellow Star Thistle began, oh, about 30 years ago in our county on the roadsides. And at that time, there was uh, not a funding, as I understand it, or opposition to roadside weed spraying. And because of the tremendous seed source of these weed plants on our roadsides, they were able to move into our meadows, such that I think yellow star thistle is the most common plant in California. Um, it didn't come from the roadsides, it came from alfalfa fields, we now have another weed, uh, stinkwort, Ditrichia graviolens, which also like to colonize the roadside edges. And as Kit has mentioned, this weed is particularly adept at growing in these little cracks of the roads, which some of us have to pay for, 
and enlarging them such that the roads degrade. Now, um, trying to get your neighbors to go out there with hula hose or whatever um, is mm, not that successful. So a number of us in the CNPS have mobilized our natives, have informed uh, neighbors, have informed our neighbors that this is a, a weed that is, uh, they really don't want in their meadows. I have a couple neighbors and it's, oh, sorry. And it's, um, crap. And it's uh, in their horse pastures and horses will not eat it. So it will just get more and more abundant. So with the onslaught of new weeds that are able to go from the roadside edges, invade our meadows, um, the county turns to herbicides because they're not gonna get out there hoeing it. And um, to allow some of these invasive weeds to migrate from our road edges into our meadows, into our native areas, into our native plant preserves um, is uh, putting organic gardening way above ecological management of a ecological danger. So, you know, um, we do manage um, the Pine Hill Preserves, uh, Jenna Meyer and I, for these weeds, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever. The only way to manage them is to go out there and hand weed them. But at some point, this organic gardening approach is not going to be good enough facing the onslaught of some of these highly invasive weeds. So, you know, I'm of two minds. Of course, there are native plants that grow on the roadside edges. But on the other hand, there are weeds that grow there that endanger our native plants. Thank you, Deborah. And so um, one other thing I just might mention is that there is a really nice weed book put out by Master Gardeners that um, for individual weeds has a whole hierarchy of, of methods going to be used from mechanical eventually to herbicides. And you can look for specific weeds and what some of that hierarchy can be for getting rid of them. Good. And then yeah. one more question here. This is kind of an interesting one. Um, Butterfly O. Um, wants to know, can we take the grubs out of our food garden, grow them separately, and then reintroduce their adult stage? Yeah. I don't know how successful that would be. But there are, okay, so Google beetle mounds. Uh, you can, and I do have this in another presentation that I do, where you can create beetle mounds around garden areas so that they're not specifically in your garden beds, so to speak, but you want them nearby. Um, I probably wouldn't, knowing if you, if you can learn to identify those grubs and know which ones they are and that they're not harmful to your plants themselves, but harmful, but they do take a toll on the pests, other pests you might have, you know, then I would just leave them alone. But, um, you know, if you find that you, you can get halfway decent. There are pages on Facebook for insect ID. And you just, all you simply need to do is take a good photograph and tell them specifically, you know, which town you're in and city and state and country, and that's all. And somebody will identify that for you. And then also um, along the same lines, can she wants to know if we can obtain a list of the bees and other beneficials that have been mentioned in this presentation. Uh, yeah, I mean, I would encourage you to look up, if, if you're from El Dorado County, yes, I mean, this, are we going to make this presentation available? It is um, going to be available as a recording, but can, it might be an idea, just like she said, just to put even a list on your homegrown habitat Facebook page, if people oh, want Oh, sure, to, yeah. I can do that, sure, yes. that's a good That's'd idea. Good. All right, well, I want to open it up to... Um, questions in person now. If anybody has a question, they can raise their hand or mute yourself. I had one question then. Um, you had mentioned that 1%, only 1% of insects are actually harmful. So by harmful, do you mean that they, I mean, because obviously most insects eat native plants. You just mean by that they eat so much that they actually kill the plant? Or what does that, that mean? One. That's what I assume that that means is that is uh -huh. that inter or or that 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 actually chew and suck on plants is the way I take it that they cause damage to plants 
themselves, other, other insects, because most insects don't eat plant materials. That's what I mean. Is that's thought, the way I, I take this number, is that the majority of insects don't feed necessarily on the plants themselves. Um, but they need those native plants, but only 1% of them eat them? That's they, funny. well, a lot of insects eat other insects. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what they, or they, they feed on the nectar and pollens and eat other insects. That's what the parasitoid white wasps and a number of those, the beetles do too. So they don't feed on the plants themselves, but they feed on, uh, they'll, they'll take advantage of pollen and nectar resources and then feed on other insects. So I, don't know the percentage of that. I just remember that being a uh, Doug Tallamy, I believe, talks about that specifically. One. Okay, thank you. You're starting to break up a it's little. Gosha, or does, does someone have so, a question? It looks like Gosha. Yeah, I, I, I do have a question. I should have tried to find. Hang on, Kit. We're kind of hearing you a little bit. There, there you are. Gosha had a question. Go ahead, Gosha. Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just have a comment about those beetles. I have no patience. I kill them. I know what they are. I kill them. Listen, you had on one of the beautiful pictures, you have a Japanese beetles. Somewhere like about half an hour ago. I forget what kind of uh, plant it was. Nothing will eat it. No birds. Oh, no. What did <laughs> Japanese beetles? Yeah, no, I don't, I've, the, never heard of, I've never heard about anything that eats Japanese beetles. If I see them, thank God, you know, I used to live in Pennsylvania. We had swarms of them. I'm glad I, we don't have them here. So that's we do. Good. We do have them here and I'm not promoting not killing those. Um, <laughs> however, so, so those are okay. Those are okay to kill. Yeah. It's just that there's going to be other insects don't use pesticides on them. Don't use insecticides on them to kill them. Because oh, when you- no, 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 no. Yeah. No, you grab so, them in the, you know, you have the gloves and you just squish them in your, in your, in your hand and that's right. it. And the no, that's fine. It can be eaten by something. And also last year I had first time in, uh, I had Oregon sunshine. I grew them myself. I had this seeds from uh, whatever, you know, company. And they're beautiful. And I had very little beetles. I don't know what they were black. And uh, you just move your hand above the, and they were eating flowers. I had no patience. So I had to go and in the morning, early in the morning, squish them. And you know, when you squish them, you, you damage the whole flower also because they were tiny and they were like sticking inside of this but I had no patient and I, I, I saved some, some flowers. There were I, would, I would say, I would say, pick your battles. I mean, if you know yeah. something is not a native, not a native insect and they are a pest, then, then no yeah, holds and barred they, in and terms and they were also, of- Yeah, they were also nothing. kind of like, they must have had some virus in their saliva or something because that um, flower died anyway. If I didn't manage to, to get so <laughs> anyway, yeah. so I have okay. no patience. But that's yeah, I have to pick my battles because I have so many battles. I have so much weeds. I don't know which one to start with. So uh, yeah, I know. Okay. Thank you, Gosha, and thank you so much, Kit. That was really a great presentation. I think you know we're all even more inspired than before to go out and put natives in our garden. And which reminds me, so our next presentation is in two months and in May and um, watch for that. I've forgotten right this minute what the topic is. I think that we have to do with the nature nook up at the um, library perhaps where there's going to be an open house. And the last thing I just wanna mention besides saying thank you to all of you for listening to this wonderful presentation was that if anyone's interested in uh, volunteering at the plant sale on April 9th, um, we can always use more volunteers um, that day when we um, organize the plants, put them into boxes and give them out to people. So if that's something you're interested in, please put that in your chat. And let's I will, I will, but do you want Thank you, okay, kids. Yes. And uh, we'll uh, see you all next time. Thank you so much. Uh, I, Alice, uh, how yes. do, you, do you want, are you going to send official email? 
or I will send an official email, but just if there's anyone here today that I don't have their email address and, or, and you want to just put in the chat. I, I, I will volunteer. I don't know which which shift or something, but I will. Okay. I've got it going. I have Thank a big you. order gotcha. and I'm not done yet, so. <laughs> okay, gotcha. And if anybody else wants to, just let me know. Okay, thanks. Good night. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank, Hi, you. Thank you, Kit. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye -bye.